Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to this week's episode and joining me for this one is the voice of Formula One, David Croft and alongside him, well, a man who has 94 Grand Prix starts, 7 wins including Monaco and a couple of Indy 500 titles to his name as well. It's Juan Pablo Montoya. Hello to you both. And, uh, How are we doing? Yeah, we'll give a little round of applause there. Hello. Round of applause. <laughs> We've Pablo. got a legend with us. Oh, my God. <laughs> David Croft is in the house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Juan Pablo Montoya is here too. What a weekend, uh, Juan Pablo, to get you in, obviously, because we've, we've got Monaco, which we've had, but also the Indy 500 as well. But I know you were in Monaco. Uh, how was it? How did you enjoy your weekend? It was really good. It was really good. You know, I was mainly here because my kids do an F3 and we had a really good weekend. We, you know, I mean, Sunday was a bit unlucky trying to pass another guy, ripped the front wing up. But yeah, the pace we had over the weekend and especially in the races was insane. So it was really good to see. It's, it's really nice to see how he's mature over the over the year and you know how much effort he's putting into it. So it's really, really exciting. And you know, from the F one point of view was was really enjoyable. You know what I mean? It, you look at qualifying and I think with a minute to go you never expected, you know, Verstappen on pole. It just didn't seem like they were not even showing him. It's like you know, like everybody, I guess the TV, the way they do it, they kind of know who's coming and what they're doing and the cameras go there and, you know, they got marked in the last sector. That was, you know, right on cue, I guess. We're, we're going to get into uh, into Max's amazing qualifying lap because it was absolutely sensational. And I want to get into talk about Sebastian, your son as well, and what it's like being a racing dad. Uh, Crofty, how was your weekend? Is, it, is Monaco one of those where you need a, a, a few days to recover afterwards? I had a lie in this morning. Uh, I must admit, it, it, it took it took me a while to get going today. Uh, it, look, it's a it's a party town when the Grand Prix is on, and it would be wrong not to uh, go and see as many people as we can during the course of the weekend. Um, I, I I was a bit upset that uh, uh, that Sebastian uh, Juan Pablo, your your son, rather ruined my breakfast on Sunday morning. I mean, that was With... way too early for a motor race. Yeah, eight o'clock in the well, morning. They do it they often. On the track. <laughs> I don't know why, but that like we did cyber yeah. last year, and it was the same thing. I think most of the European races were raised about eight eight thirty. But I was trying to have a nice, you know, scrambled eggs and bacon by the side of the track, and then you know, yeah, around comes Sebastian with a damaged front wing, making way too much noise, ruined my breakfast. It did. <laughs> well, maybe it was good for you. No. <laughs> yeah. To, to be honest, maybe I need it, mate. You're right. Um, no, no. Listen, I, I thought Monaco. I thought Monaco was great this year, um, for many, many reasons. It was great to see the stand so packed. It was great to see, you know, the harbour absolutely packed. From a commercial sense, Monaco is massively important uh, to Formula One. It's still a place where the fans flock to. They want to see racing cars on the streets there. Qualifying was one of the best qualifying sessions I've ever had the pleasure to commentate on, quite frankly. Um, that last sector, Aston Martin, Fernando Alonso, quickest in sector one, sector two, and then only 10th fastest in the final sector. That's where Max had the opportunity um, to, to, to really get back and take that pole. And I remember saying in the commentary, you know, he's, he, he, if anyone could do it, he can. An incredible driver, a rocket ship of a car, and then bang, he's on pole by a few hundreds. Just so, so dramatic. You know, Charles Leclerc's heart's broken, Aston Martin's heart's broken, and Max ends up on top. And um, the trouble with Monaco qualifying is absolutely everything. We had we had a race, we had a had a good race. I'd like to see better racing, but I'm no genius as to how we answer the problem of uh, of overtaking around Monaco these days. But, yeah, we, but at least we did have a race. To be honest with you, if, if Monaco wasn't that short of a racetrack compared with the current tracks, qualifying wouldn't be that exciting. It's like at some point in Q3, it's like like on the screens, on this, it was 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.0, 0.1. It's like it's insane. You don't have people. You don't have people running away, and you're in your toes waiting to see who can find that extra tenth. That in Monaco is huge, and being a street course, you can find that tenth. You know what I mean? If you push that little barrier a little closer, and you go to the apex a little closer, and the small details make a massive difference, and and it, it genuinely delivered. Um, do you want better racing? Yeah, I think everybody wants always a better racing, but 
I think the tradition of Mon Monaco, the three course and everything, um, I mean, the rain was a great twist. And in a way, I think Aston generally had a shot of winning when they went for those medium tires. That it was shocking. Oh, you, you think you think they absolutely got it wrong there? Because well, I, I it, think there's people in the team think that we missed out on it as well. But they, if, if you, I mean, yeah, they, they're, they thought, okay, he's on hearts. It's going to rain a little bit. We're going to put mediums. Mark's going to have to put hearts. Um, we're going to look really good. And I think that's the play they went for it. What they didn't see was the yeah. amount of rain that was coming. But who did? The, tr the, the trouble was all the forecasts were that it was only going to be a sprinkling of rain. It wasn't going to be a massive shower. And that's that's what we got in the end. Yeah, so why didn't Lewis behind uh, Fernando put wets on the same lap? Were they just magicians and they went, oh, we got to put, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> they, they saw something that whoever did the weather in Aston didn't see. You gotta say. Well, I think whoever did the weather for the whole for the whole of Sunday didn't quite get it right, did they? Twenty percent chance of rain. Crofty, you were saying your it, your what, what your your guy on the boat said there was very little chance yeah, or something Captain, like that. Captain Max on the boat, he said there's going to be some <laughs> rain at two o'clock, and it's wouldn't uh, trust him. Be, uh, he said, <laughs> I tr <laughs> I'd trust him with my life, Captain Max. He was brilliant. Um, <laughs> he's two o'clock. It's only going to be a light sprinkle. Um, but if you look, Pierre Gasly was exactly the same at Alpine. They they did the same with Gasly at Alpine as Aston Martin did with uh, with Fernando. Um, in hindsight, yeah, they, they, they got it wrong. Speaking to some of the Red Bull guys on the plane home last night, they they said had Fernando had gone straight onto intermediates, it would have been very very close. Because um, Max, they were still going to wait for a, a, a lap, maybe a couple of laps. He's tiptoeing around. Fernando's got the intermediate tyres on. And they said, you know, we, we kind of feared if he went to try the undercut with the intermediates, we know this is going to be close. We think we still would have won it, but it would have been much, much tighter. Um, but, you know, these decisions, as you well know, JP, and they're, they're made in a split second, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, we've got yeah, the I mean, benefit to, to analyse it after the event. Yeah, yeah the question is... Do you go conservative or you go for broke? And the way I think, in a funny way, I think Aston went for broke with the intermediate tire, with the with the medium tire, thinking it was going to be the aggressive play, and the aggressive play was the other tire. Starting on the hard yeah. tire, I think was was a brilliant strategy, yeah. and and Max's win and the way he had to manage those mediums for so long, actually. We, we should doff our cap a bit more to the way Max went and won that race yesterday because Aston put him in a world of pain and a world of trouble and he overcame it and drove very, very well. When he went through the graining um, and emerged a bit cleaner on the other side, that, that, that was sensational driving. Yes, Fernando's rears suffered a bit more with the graining than was expected, but that was a masterstroke of strategy to go on that hard tyre, thinking, well, Max is going to go medium because he's wanting to get the launch and he... Doesn't want to become, just whisper it, Matt, the first person since Juan Pablo Montoya to start on pole and not lead the first lap in Monte Carlo. Still one of my favourite stats, JPM. Sorry about that. That's all good. <laughs> <laughs> You're completely out of my control. You press a button and it went. <laughs> <laughs> but, it is, but that just shows you the start is so important. 2002 was the last time the pole sitter didn't lead the first lap, or the person starting in front, I should say, didn't lead the first lap in Monaco. There you go. What I what I think it does perfectly, and what what it tees up our conversation about on this podcast is is actually, and what you were saying, Juan Pablo, was was re with regards to Alonso and Aston Martin, the fact that they are now contending for wins on a weekly basis, and that decision of of going for broke, as you put it, is actually indicative of the fact that they're gutsy. They're going to go for these opportunities because that's how they're going to get into. Red Bull uh, into Red Bull and Verstappen, and and I think what I, I just want to go through some of the quotes that Alonso said after the race, um, because he very much believes that Aston Martin are in with a chance, perhaps this year, but definitely next year of taking the fight to Red Bull. So he said, you know, back in 2010 they didn't have the best car, but they arrived leading the championship in Abu Dhabi. He said in 2012 they still didn't have the best car, but they were fighting for the championship until the last lap in Brazil. He said, this is motorsport. Anything can happen. I'll be fighting for the championship with all second places until the end of the year or fighting for the championship next year. So Juan Pablo, when you hear those words from Fernando Alonso, 
does that get you excited? Does that make you believe that Aston Martin really are here and here to stay? Um, there. I mean, this year they came out with a great car. You gotta give it to them. The car is unbelievable. It has really good speed. It drives really well, and I think Fernando's done a really good job of putting, of driving the whole team behind him. You gotta give it to him. The big question mark is, can they replicate and come up with something as competitive next year? If you're talking long term, it's you know what I mean. You, you're not gonna say what they did this year was a fluke. But you look at Mercedes with the people they have and everything, they came out this year worse again than last year. And you would have never thought after how much they dominated the sport before that they, I know they got it wrong last year, but come out this year without, with a worse car. It's like, how can they do that? So the chances of getting a car wrong are not... That you know, I mean, I think it's harder to get it right than wrong. I totally agree with that. I think where Aston have a slightly better advantage than Mercedes is it the concept of car that is succeeding in this this current iteration of Formula One um, was was not the Mercedes concept that gave them so much domination from from 2014 to, to 2021, where you know Lewis lost the title obviously but Mercedes were still constructors uh, champions they've had to they've had to reinvent their wheel so to speak Aston Martin with Dan Fallows leading them technically Dan coming from Red Bull um, he understands where Adrian Newey's inspiration and philosophy translates to it to a good car and it's that kind of higher raked car that is now succeeding given the slight changes to the floor and the diffuser that have been made in the last couple of years. But so the I think Red Bull it's right is not time, right. right place, right, this year. right man. That's the weird thing. Like, no, not this year. Exactly. Not this so year, like, but that's, Red that, Bull, like, that's it, what helped him last year yeah, to then yeah. go forwards for this year. Exactly. You know? So what do you, if you're Aston, then you look at, you know, if you're him and you look at Red Bull's flat, then do we go back to a flat car? What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think there's there's a bit of break in there, but he understands where Adrian New is. Yeah, uh, philosophy is it right. Yes, yeah, and I think also that, that there's two other key members. There's Eric Blondin in, in Aerodynamics, who's come from Mercedes, who Dan also worked with at, at Red Bull for for a few years, and there's Luca Fabato on, on the chassis side, and all three of them have formed a very good technical leadership with the new staff that have come in. To, 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 to drive this team forward. This is quite this is quite an important day we're recording this podcast on today for Aston Martin. This is the day they move into their new factory. It's moving day at Silverstone today. So, you know, the old Silverstone base that, that Eddie Jordan started and became Midland Spiker Force India Racing Point, that will be no longer. The new factory is up and is operational. There'll be a wind tunnel to come as well. Um, there'll be a conference centre eventually on, on that. There'll be an engine project with Honda. They'll be making their own gearboxes. They'll no longer be getting technical support from other people. They'll be doing it all themselves. And with that comes challenges, but with that comes a lot more advanced information as to where the mounting points for the engine are going to be on the chassis, for instance. They could be, and I think they will be, the next Red Bull in Formula One. They've got the vision. They've got the money. They've got the strategy. They've got the people. They have the people. And as Rob Smedley said, they have the people. And as Rob Smedley said to me, and Rob knows a few things, other than Red Bull at the moment, who else is more committed to winning than Aston Martin? And I think that's a really good sentence there. It's that commitment to win. You have to invest. And Mercedes have invested. Ferrari have invested. Aston Martin are investing. At this time in the present... They're the team going forwards. Juan Pablo, is it is that true? It's all about the people. Those are that's how you succeed in Formula One is by getting good people at the right time, at the peak of their powers, and putting them in one team together, like Lawrence Stroll has done. Well, Mercedes kind of has the same thing. The, the the key thing here for me is apart from getting the key people, is getting them to work together and understand that they each one has its own responsibility and being able to bond all together. Because it's very easy. You can bring, you know, the best aero guy, the best suspension guy, the best everything, but each one is pulling their own way and thinking they're right and the other guy is wrong. 
uh, you're never going to succeed. And, and being able to get all that, and that's a little bit what Mercedes did before. And thought was where Toto was really, really good is put everything together. And Red Bull is very good at it as well. So I think Lawrence really understands that, you know, how, you know, how important people are. And everybody, I think Fernando is kind of the driving force behind it right now. Everybody, when Fernando got on board and is doing what he's doing and is bringing people together. That's a really key point that you make there, uh, Juan Pablo, bringing people together. There, there, there was a time that had what happened in yesterday's race in Monaco happened, Fernando would have been the first person screaming, you ruined it for me. You know, I wanted to go on the intermediates. So I asked if you were sure. You got it wrong. You cost me. And he would have done that before. It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, Fernando says, look, in hindsight, maybe we should have done something. But at that time, that was the right thing to do because it wasn't raining that much. He is the team player that I've always wanted to see Fernando Alonso be. Because, you know, JPM as a driver, you have to be that team player because without your team, you're never going to win races. You, you're nothing. And, and you have to get the team on the side. Be nice to the crew and the crew will be nice to you. Absolutely. Juan Pablo, did you hear, it was in Baku, wasn't it? When um, sort of midway through the lap, Fernando was giving some information that would have helped Lance. Yeah. Is that a Fernando, that's a new Fernando, isn't it? That, that I don't think a lot of people recognise, but one that we're all loving, right? Um, I think where Fernando is right now is in a really good situation because he, he doesn't feel threatened by Lance. He understands that is his last chance to, to win again. They build a really good car. And the more he can do to bring everybody together, the better they're going to be. I think in the point of his career, he he's okay sharing. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, you can share everything as long as you believe you can still be the guy. And you still got to bring the, your A game. And, and he's doing that. He's bringing the A game. And, and if you see Lance, you know, you look at through qualifying, there was times where Lance was really, really strong. It's just... When is the really little bit of go time? When it's you know, I mean, the ultimate thing, he's still missing a little bit. But you know, Lance has come a long way, and I think Fernando's gonna make him a much better driver. It, mm. It's worth saying, Matt, and we know that Monaco is about qualifying. Lance got unlucky in qualifying, yes. Lando had his moments at Tabac. Lance went over some debris, damaged his floor. They didn't know he had floor damage until they got the car back. Um, from Park Fermi and they saw the damage there. That cost him quite quite dearly. Um, and in the end, you know, there wasn't enough fuel to do one more lap, you know, and his chance went. He could have been in Q3. He could have finished up in the top six, but he found himself starting 14th, where after getting unlucky, he, he was the master of his own downfall in the race. He was hot-headed. He was impatient. He was going for moves that weren't there. You have to be patient around Monaco. And... And he, and he cost himself and, and, and ended up retiring after too many scrapes. I, I saw him as he left the track and he didn't want to talk to anyone and he was blanking most people as well. He looked furious, he looked upset, and I can totally understand why. But I think being Fernando's teammate will make him a better driver if he's prepared to learn from Fernando, and I think he is. And I'm sure the team behind the scenes are saying, right, we're not expecting you to be Fernando. There's, there's nobody on the grid who's Fernando or at that level, except I think Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen. That's how good that man is at the moment or through his, through his career. But if you can learn from him, you, you, you can raise your game to be as good as a Lando Norris, a George Russell, you know, a, a Charles Leclerc. That's what we're expecting from you. Not, we're not expecting you to be Fernando Alonso. I'm okay with what he did. You know I mean, with a car as fast as he had, you can either sit in line and do nothing or, or try. You know I mean, if you, if you sit in line and do nothing, you, you might be lucky to get a point or two. And if you go for it and it works, you look really good. And if you don't, oh, okay, you missed a point or two. Is that what you said to Sebastian yesterday then? Uh, uh, in tell me, when I Sebastian did. came back. In uh, in uh, yeah? in, so it's funny because in, I under, like, the, the other guy on the braking when he was when he finally got next to him into turn one when they got to the braking zone the guy hit him at the middle of the braking zone and yeah. when they came up the hill when they went through the little zigzag up the hill the guy actually moved right 
and kind of opened the door. Sebastian mm. went in and the guy chopped the door. And and he hit him once and he like the second time did the damage on the tire. Like the guy the guy kind of felt it and then he tried to shut the door thinking Sebastian had lifted. And I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? It's like if you if you're the guy in front and your tires are going off and you're burning your tires off just to try to keep one person behind, you're not that smart. Mm. And you know what I mean? And what he did, yeah, it was good. You know what I mean? In hindsight, like like somebody told me, like the first three times you came to Monaco, you didn't finish. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. And then it was the same. <laughs> uh, no, but it's true. And if you look at his pace at the end of the race, we were about two seconds a lot quicker than anybody. That it's a copy yeah. of me. That is, you know, I mean, it's really, really good. And it's same in qualifying. I said to him, look, if you do three good laps in qualifying and you get a chance of a fourth lap, I don't want to hear that you had a couple of tens somewhere. And he clipped the right rear in the back and we were on pace easily for Paul. But it's what it is. But I'm, I'd rather him do that and get it a little wrong than come back and said, oh, I gave up two tenths here, a tenth there, and a tenth there. Because I, I had a little room. You can't. At this level, you can't. And I'm okay going over it and making a mistake and learn from the mistake and understand how, can you, how far you can really go. And I think he's doing a mega job on point of that. At the, at the same time, after the crash, I said, look, like, knowing that you have such a fast car, you could have been a little smarter and picked a, a better place to be to risk the car. Because at the end of the day, when the guy is hitting you every time you get next to you, you're going to end up bouncing into each other. And you just got to find a way where you might have a little bit of upper hand when you bounce into each other. That's absolutely fascinating. In, in my age, when I did it, I would have done the same thing. that it, I did. I, I flew over freaking Jamie Davies in, in, in F2 back in the day, going into the same place. Yeah. Uh, he left it. I didn't lift when I broke the front wing. I still flew over him. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is Lawrence Stroll. So that, that's your racing dad mentality there, and I love it. And, and honestly, there is so much room in Formula One for the new version of Juan Pablo Montoya. You know, we can't wait for Sebastian to get there. But is Lawrence Stroll saying the same thing to Lance? Look, yeah, because he's got to pay the bills if there is a crash, remember? Honestly, if they're not, they need to. He, Lance has an opportunity. Lance is a lot better than people think he is. And I think he's very mm-hmm. underrated. And I think, you know, he's, he's a really nice guy and he's very quiet. But I think he needs somebody on his corner to kick <laughs> And really go, really, buddy? It's like you lost two tens here because what? You know what I mean? Like he needs to come out of his comfort zone. And in a way, that's going to be a couple of shunts and a couple of, oh. And what he did in Monaco trying, it, it was the right, like, I understand where you're starting with the fast car you have. Everybody goes for the inside in turn one and the, everybody checks up. And he went for the outsides and, and it wasn't wrong. And then when you get to the herpin, now everybody covers up. And But when he went to dive bomb, you know, somebody kind of arced it. And he was kind of unlucky. But I'd rather see him try that just sit there. Because next time he does it, the next guy, the guy knows he's coming. And knowing, like when you're passing somebody and, and they know you're coming, they'll give you the room because they know you're okay with hitting them. Well, and Pablo, you're, so not only is obviously Sebastian racing in F3, but you also race together in the European Le Mans series as well. So how does that change your dynamic? Obviously, that's you watching him, but how does it feel when you race with him? Um, it kind of sucks because he's really quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but well, it's fun. It, it, you need a target then. Oh, dude, I, I don't you need someone to put it this for. way. I don't make his life easy because I'm still pretty quick. <laughs> um, and it, it's really good fun because technically he's very good. He's very good understanding. There's few things like the, his understanding of the tires. It's insane. I'm very good at understanding the peak of the tire and the grip of the tire. But like the overheating, the things that happen with the tire is really cool to see. I was like, oh, no, 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 here, just relax the tire a little. Do this here. It's going to help. I'm going to, like, 
Screw you. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, if you, so here's good. a question for you, JPM. Here's a question. If you had the money, would you buy a Formula One team and race your son in that Formula One team? Oh, absolutely. And how would you react then if, you know, crashes are costing you money or he's but not it's quite it's costing me today. To, to... <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not too much. No, no, no. He's pretty good, actually. But if it happens, it's part of the process. You know what I mean? It's the reality. I don't think you can expect to be at this level and, and tell your kid or whoever you're looking after, hey, don't risk the car or don't try to pass because you might do a little bit of damage because might as well just go home. I think we're long past the, the debate as to, you know, Lawrence bought racing point for Lance just so Lance could race in F1. That, that argument, I think, is long gone now because what we have is a very competitive team and car on the grid. And whatever the reasons for Lawrence Stroll's involvement on that one, the benefits far outweigh, oh, he's just done it for, for his son. You know, there's 800 people at Silverstone who are getting their mortgage paid now when that team might have folded uh, a few years ago. And, and, and we've got a state-of-the-art facility uh, being created. And you have a um, Honda contract. I, I, I'm with JP. And you have a Honda contract and, and Honda coming back into F1. I, I, th I think it's really exciting times. And I think Lance is more than good enough to hold his own in Formula 1. Otherwise... He'd never have got a pole. He'd never have got podiums. He'd never been the youngest guy ever to start on, on the front row. And he'd never have won championships coming up into Formula One. There you go. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask a question as well about other racing dads uh, and looking particularly at Jos Verstappen as well, because he seems to be this seat. I mean, definitely he's been a key part of that team and and that outfit but Juan Pablo I don't know what you make of seeing Jos Verstappen kind of he seems really involved now in that Red Bull team doesn't he you sort of see shots of Max when he wins and Jos is right there almost every week um I, I don't know how involved he is or if he's involved at all I think he's more enjoying the ride than anything else I think at this point where Max is and the background of Jos and when he raced uh, it's just different times, you know what I mean? It's the, the hybrid systems, the, all the things that go on nowadays are, uh, are foreign, you know, foreign objects for a lot of us, you know what I mean? Like, for me, the Pirelli tires are, are, for me, in a way, you know, they do a great job for F1 and everything, but, like, it, for, for their marketing, it's amazing because it's a topic and you're talking about tires all day. But in a sporty, you know, the tires shouldn't really be the topic. Yeah. It's like, you That's know, no, going, very, very you know, point. running and the guys winning because their shoes are better than somebody else's, you know what I mean? Or they're in the right window, the rubber, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of strange, but this is where the sport is right now. And the importance of understanding the tire is a big part of it. And it's a big part of all of the drivers to understand how they need to manage it and everything. Where yeah, in my time, definitely. I'll give an example. When we used to do the tire testing in, when I was in F1, initially I tried, you know, manage the tires and they came back and said, don't manage them, destroy them. I'm like, but they're going off. I'm like, yes, we need them to go off to understand what we need to do, how to make them better, because it's the only way we're going to beat the competition. Mm. You always struck me, uh, JPM, as a, as a man who'd rather have his teeth pulled out by a pair of pliers than go tyre testing for a, for a day at Paul Ricard or something. That that never seemed to be something you really wanted to do in your career. I, or, 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 no, or did you? I really enjoyed tyre testing. Um, so we normally testing used to have two cars. It was the BMW car yeah. that normally used to be driven by Mark Genet or the test driver and the race car for the tyre testing that was split between Ralph and myself or Kimi and myself, um, the, the engine one, it, it was, you know, I did a few times, that wasn't fun. Yeah, you know I mean, they fill up the car with fuel and you pound around all day just to put the miles on the engine. Where in the other car, you're qualifying, you know, 20 sets of tires in a day. It's still driving an F1 car, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but remember when it's your job, you know, I mean, yeah. But when you're, you know, when you're, Thinking about performance all day, you don't realize how important the engine making it to the end is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> I can imagine. I just uh, I want to I want to come back on to a little bit the Aston Martin story and just regards to Fernando Alonso and his impact in the team. So he uh, well he's forty one years old and that makes him the oldest driver to finish on the podium in Monaco since Jack Bra- since Jack Brabham in nineteen seventy. At the age of forty one, Crofty, is this the mm. best Fernando that you've seen? I think he's as good as he was when he won the world championships in 05 and 06 in terms of his driving. I think it's the best Fernando as a human being. So we're getting a better all round package at the moment. But Oscar it's Piastri, easy. Um, said so. It's but sorry, I, I love interrupting. I know, as you know, this. <laughs> uh, come on, um, Do it, I think Fernando is the same season. Fernando has always been. It's just... You know what I mean? When he was with, you know, with McLaren and with Honda and all the struggles, when you go to the races to win and you're running 18 from the grid, when you know you can win, it's the most miserable time of your life. And everybody around you, it's the worst person on earth and you don't want to talk to anybody. And everything about going to the racetrack makes you miserable. And all of a sudden, you know, you see this bright light at the end of the tunnel that you think it could be another world championship and the chance of being seen, you know, not seen, but the the chance of reliving another win and maybe even a championship and and dominance. It's, it's easy. And then you're in a great mood. And then when they talk to you, you're this new happy person. I'll interrupt you now, though. I, I think he's a much happier person than, than he was even in his Ferrari years as well. It's even the hard. years when he went to Abu Dhabi. and had, yeah, Well, it's just, at that time, Ferrari you know, rather dragged you down a bit. I'm, I'm glad to say Ferrari are a much more open and nicer team now than they were back in, in 2010, 2012. But I think Fernando, he just isn't a better place as a, as a human being. Yes, Certainly you get uh, much more time with him to, to, to delve into the race weekend or, or to interact with him in the paddock. And, that, and that's much appreciated. He's more supportive to his teammate and to his team as well. But I want to go back to something Oscar Piastri said. Um, and I said, Look, what did you learn from Fernando when you were watching him from the garage at, at Alpine last year? And he said, I learned that he spends 25% of his brain capacity during a race racing and concentrating on the driving. The other 75% is working out the strategy and working out how he can make things better for himself, not necessarily with what he does with the car on track in, in, in a corner or, or, or in a moment for an overtake. He thinks his way through a race, Oscar said, like, like no driver I've ever seen before. And I think, you know, as long as that bit continues, Fernando, there's no reason Fernando can't carry on for another four or five years and be part of that Honda revolution at, at Aston Martin when it happens in 2026. Certainly saying the right things now about I'd be honoured to drive a, uh, a Honda engine again. You know, that, that was a good bit of PR that he did there in, in Monaco. I, I, I still think, I, I've said, always said this, I think he is a first choice on a team principal shortlist as to who I should have as one of my drivers. You can only have two, and I used to say it would be Fernando and Lewis Hamilton would be would be the drivers I'd pick. I'd probably want to put Max Verstappen in and have a three-car team now. And I would love to see Max and Fernando and Lewis driving in the same car because I think we'd get brilliant racing between the three of them because they're all very different drivers in their own way. Yeah. What a prospect that is. <laughs> no, no, no. I, you know, I mean, in a way, I agree, but... The other thing you got to understand, Fernando, at his point in his career, he has nothing to prove to anybody. And yeah. I think right now he's proving a lot of people wrong and is telling a lot of people to shove it. You know, because a lot of people, when probably when he was signed at, at Aston, a lot of people thought, why would you sign him for so many years? Or why, you know, I mean, it's crazy. And the drive to be, you know, to prove people wrong and tell everybody, you know, as opposed to shove it and and make everybody like you. You know what I mean? It's like Vettel just left the, you know, F1 last year and nobody's even talking about it. It's, not, it's like he didn't even exist in Aston last year. And in a way, 
he was probably a big part of why the car was competitive this year. He drove the team in the right direction in suspension, in geometries, in feel, what he was missing and everything. And he hasn't even been mentioned. He, he was in Monaco. He was in the team's garage. He, he came to see the team uh, in Monaco. And he's not missed on the track. That, that is for sure. I, I, and I do... I hate to agree with JPM, but he is absolutely spot on. Behind the scenes, he really did give that team a brilliant steer as to the direction they should be going. They 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 benefited hugely from his experience and the two years that he, he was with them, even if the results weren't always great on the track. But you know, let's not forget yesterday, Fernando's second place was a was a best equaling performance, and Seb got the second place for them too. Juan Pablo, you made your debut, didn't you, with Fernando Alonso yep. in 2001. Can you can you remember what sort of driver he was then? He was nice. Like we we got on on nothing. You know, with Fernando, we always got on really well because you know we were probably the only two guys that spoke Spanish. Um, and we always had a really good relationship. We were both didn't really care what people thought of us, and and we always had good laughs and a lot of respect for each other. If you think back to 2001, when you were both making your debut, can you still believe he's going at 41? Yeah, in a way, yes. The thing is, you, he grew up in, like in Europe, and he's only done Europe. So he's never seen the American side of things. Where for me, I, before I did F1, I went to America, and I saw both sides of the world, and I, know, and I knew both sides of the world were, were okay. You know what I mean? So... At his age, there's not really a big deal. You know what I mean? It's he. You know what I mean? He. You know what I mean? He's he's on his prime, and because he's done it for so long, F1 is not complicated. F1 is not. It's not. You know what I mean? Let's not say it's not magical, but there's no. It's your job, and it's like you know you can have the best job in the world, but when you don't really know, it's not intimidating. It's just a job, and. And it's the challenges to get the job done and to win. Uh, and that's it. And you show up in the race weekends and you have no pressure. You you can only do good. If, if the team is off in a weekend, well, they're off. We, you know, we struggle here. And when they're good, you know, they're enjoying success. Crofty, I want to put this to you. Mm -hmm. So it's a decade since Fernando Alonso last won a Formula One race in yep. Spain in 2013. And we're going to Spain. Where are we going this week? The Spanish Grand Prix. There you are, Juan Pablo. You see where this the Spanish Grand Prix this is the Red Bull weekend. Could this be? Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. I am going to say on. that. It is. It's Fernando's time. It is time. a Red Bull track. A hundred percent Red Bull track. <laughs> I mean, it's a fast track. Remember, probably the highlight of the Aston is slow speed corners, and the last sector they got rid of the slowest corners, and it's too. One probably in qualifying, both of them were going to be wide open in the F1. I think the Aston might be a little bit closer, and I think there will be more upgrades to come that we didn't quite see in Monaco. But I don't so see. So Red Bull is not put an upgrade at the moment. No, well, the, wait for the answer. <laughs> wait for it to finish, Mister <laughs> Impatience of Monaco. Um, <laughs> it's it's showbiz. We got we just got to make it sound interesting. Yeah, for five come minutes. on, come on, go. Uh, no. <laughs> Yeah, no chance. Um, no, um, the Red Bull is very fast in the straight line. It's very fast through high speed corners. Uh, the Aston um, is good through some of the slower speed corners. As JPM says, they've taken those out. Like, I can't see the pecking order changing. Uh, it really this week it should be another Verstappen, Perez, Alonso in that order podium with with, with I think Max Max winning it. The big story I think to come out of of Monaco was how Sergio absolutely blew his chance to put more pressure on his teammate. Yes. That that was a, as bad a weekend for Sergio Perez as he could possibly have wished for, and I'm sure he didn't wish for any of it. Um, how he rebuilds his season after that will be absolutely fascinating because it's not just blowing it in terms of no points, but it's on a street track where he's been really, really good on street tracks, where he's gone to Monaco as last year's winner, and he's ended up crashing qualifying and, and crashing quite a bit in the race as well that that wasn't a good weekend for Sergio I would agree on that the other thing I think interesting going to Barcelona is the Mercedes package how is it going to perform yeah. because all the changes they did for the downforce are 
cannot be relevant in Monaco. The handling, you know, the front geometry change probably was a big deal here, but the downforce changes and side foot changes they did, Barcelona is the number one place where you're going to see a difference. So that's going to be interesting to see how much they really have stepped up. Crofty, are you expecting Mercedes to improve in lap time? Because is it fair to say we didn't see that improvement in Monaco? I, I think I actually think we saw we saw the start of a of a different path, and the path is that, that they know they should have gone down a lot sooner at Mercedes. I, I, I don't think they had a bad weekend at all. I actually think they can be quite satisfied with that weekend that both Lewis and George beat the two Ferraris. I think Ferrari had a had another horror as well, and and they did have a horror for Ferrari. They should be they should be better than that, and they weren't. Uh, to be honest, and I know Charles just missed out in the, in the latter stages of of qualifying, but in the race, you know, they were making strange decisions once again, dummy calls for for, for Carlos Sainz that weren't really necessary because he wasn't really going to put Esteban Ocon under un, under trouble, and they lost out with the pit stops with, with all the rain. But I think whilst the Mercedes looks it looks a real ungainly, ugly. Martin described it as a Frankenstein's monster sort of car. It does. It looks like it's taken. Like uh, inspiration from the inside of a steel drum and needs a good panel beater. It doesn't look. <laughs> That's like why a I like it. I guess piece of bodywork. Yeah, exactly. It's it's it's, it's very much like uh, like like Wan's weathered face over the years. No, I don't mean that. No, um, it's all good. It's, it's the truth. It, <laughs> yeah, true. But you know, when it smiles, that cheeky smile, we absolutely love it, and it might smile a cheeky smile uh, from time to time. It 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 will be refined. But they've got to start somewhere and they've started somewhere different in a hurry or more of a hurry than they would have wanted. So look, this this is the journey. I'm not expecting Mercedes to go to Barcelona and suddenly be quicker than Aston Martin either. Because no, everything I hear within the team is it's it's a maximum of four tenths of a second at some tracks. It's probably about two tenths uh, at other tracks. And, you know, whilst they're upgrading, others are upgrading and that's the way it'll go this season. Before we go, and since we've got you on, Juan Pablo, we've got to talk about the Indy 500 this weekend because Joseph Newgarden ended his 11-year wait. You know, frustration, so much frustration. He finally won the Indy 500, and he did it on the final lap, passing Marcus Ericsson uh, after a third red flag. I mean, you, you raced in it last year, and you've won it twice. What did you make of that final sprint finish? Because it was epic, wasn't it? I thought it was amazing. You know what I mean? In a way, you could see a lot of things coming. You look at Pato last year, for example. He backed off in the last corner, thinking championship for the Indy 500 when he had a shot of winning it. And this year, he was with a revenge, and he wanted to prove to everybody that he was never going to back down. And he didn't back down, but he turned into the grass. Like, I understand how stressful of a move it is because I've done it, but he made a mistake, and, and he paid the consequences. Um, but from there on, he just packed the whole field and put the race upside down. You know what I mean? It, it, it was unbelievable. I, I was, I don't know. It's just so hard with two laps to go in a shootout. You know, you're going to get passed. It, it was nearly better, f you know, for New Garner, you know what I mean? To pass earlier if you wanted to get him back. The way he, he had such a good restart on New Garner that there's just no way to come back. Like there was not enough momentum to be able to build it back. And and you gotta give it, give it to Joseph. He did some brave moves into turn one around the outside. Like he committed more than the guy. If the guy inside would have committed, it would have been ugly. But he had the moves, he had the confidence and and he delivered. And if you look at Indy, 90% of the time, at the end of the race, are the usual suspects fighting for the win. It's surprising, you know, it's a shame. Palau was a shame because I thought he had a winning car. I think he generally, like, he had the winning car, in my opinion. And, you know, Dixon, I don't know what's, you know, I mean, I think with Dixon is to the point that it's in his head and it doesn't matter what he does, they get it wrong. You know what I mean? They can win everywhere, but they go there and 
I think that works. They overwork and overthink everything, and they screw themselves. Uh, but it was, I mean, mm. entertaining as hell. As always, most of the race is really calm, and everybody gives each other room. And you know, somebody gets it wrong, and and you end up with you know crash here and there. But oh my god, that shootout at the end—it's it, nail biting. And I think from IndyCar to bring the red flag was the right call. I understand the frustration that you're not going to get a pace lap because they want to give the, you know, the fans a better show and you're going to go, Oh, that's unfair. Everybody, you know, every other restart you have, um, in a way, if that was the rules, you probably could have do something different if you're leading the race to, you know what I mean? kind of force IndyCar's hand as well. If IndyCar is forcing your hand, you can force it in a weird way. You know, you pull into the truck and they're going to tell you we're going to go straight away. You pull into the truck and you just go. The lap counts. And what are they going to say? Oh, you should have gone. But the lap already counted. Crofty, I think you would have been midair at this point while this was going on. But I was making my dinner and I was I just had the telly on in the background and I saw I saw the crash. This was mm. the one between Carl Kirkwood and Felix Rosenquist. And yeah. it was... Utterly terrible. Why did he open the visor? And... Yeah, that's my question. Right. So, so, okay, so, so, right, please, someone explain. So, so here's the thing: we weren't in midair by that time. Um, ah, okay. I actually, I, so I got on the plane, um, sat in seat one C was Mike Crack of Aston Martin. Mike Crack's got his phone in his hand, watching live the Indy 500. He's got a feed going on there, and all his engineers are crowded around him. And as I walk down the plane. Um, there's more and more engineers all watching the Indy 500. Trust me, you know, we are motorsport lovers. Just because we're in F1, it doesn't mean we ignore the Indy, which it was a sensational finish. So exciting. Um, rights or wrongs, I kind of don't care. because It Joseph was a Lugan great show, an and he win. deserved it. I agree. Yeah, it was a brilliant show, and he deserved to win, and sometimes the end story is better than what happened uh, within the moment. But with the visor... I'm sat next to Anthony Davidson and we, we watched uh, some clips of the accident and we both said at the same, why is he lifting his visor? What's all that about? And I, to this, even Ant couldn't explain why it would be necessary to do that right. or why he would want to. But Yeah, like for him, my, I think he, when he's he running that. backwards, he feels, ah, oh, okay, I'm, you know, crash is done and lifts his visor to get out of the car. And like, you're still sliding. Yeah, no, but surely quite that's fast. the one moment you need the visor. Yeah. If, you know, from everything that's happening around yeah, any you, oils, you know, peels, anything point. with that amount of sparks. Yeah. But yeah. hey, nothing will happen. I'm gonna, yeah. I, get, I get that it gets hot in there, but there's a time and a place, quite frankly. <laughs> it really does. Well, Juan Pablo, what is it about? Um, what is it about ovals? That's I mean, because to watch them as a viewer at home, they just look, are just so exciting to watch. How is it to race ovals? Because I almost feel like you guys who do it are sort of built a bit differently, to, certainly to me. I don't know about you, Crofty. For me personally, it's really, really, you know, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of strategy, how you position the car. I don't know if you notice when you're being able to pass people, you manage to bring the car a little lower, you time it. The timing of the passes are really important. Like you, it's like playing a little bit of chess with race cars. And instead of having, like going to Silverstone, instead of having a ton of corners, you have four cups. You know, straight cops, straight cops, straight cops, straight cops. And you got to make it around cops 800 times. <laughs> and you don't lift at cops. Incredible. That's the thing. So you, you don't lift much, <laughs> I would imagine, around these Same. Do, you, do you basically spend? You, you do lift a lot in cops. I was going to say, do you... Okay. But do you spend most of your time, when you're not in traffic, just driving at a wall? Is that is that the idea? No, you, you're basically aiming I, for a wall? No, I, I, I don't drive that high when I race. You honestly, you kind of know where to turn and you, you kind of aim where you want to land the car. We, what we call about landing the car is because the banking is not a lot there, but as the banking increases, mm -hmm. catching the right angle into the banking is really important. And you aim to be as low as possible without touching the concrete. Those concrete patches are really bumpy and make the car move a lot, it's scary a lot. I think they're awesome. I would love to have a go around an oval. I really would. You would really like, enjoy. They, they have a, a thrill. A, they have a two-seater cars. Uh, I took my wife the last summer, last year, wasn't it? Yeah, last year that I did Indy. I uh, took my wife in a two-seater, and she was shocked how quick it was. 
Like, like it was funny because like we're only doing like 200 miles an hour, and I go, oh, you know what I mean? Like, and she goes, oh my god, my neck pull. I'm going, oh, this was really slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Juan Pablo, if you can get that two seater car for us, you are more than welcome to sit in the back while I drive an oval. That's no problem at for all. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> you can be my this passenger time anytime year. you want absolutely <laughs> yeah, make it happen matt <laughs> we'll make it happen you heard it here first uh that's it that feels like a lovely way to end it um Juan pablo thank you so much for your time really really appreciate it crofty thank you as well uh are you both off to spain next oh uh, yeah my kids raising. you are crofty yeah perfect well Fingers crossed right. for Sebastian. I hope it Thank goes you. well. Has he got another early Sunday morning race? Do I need to get up even earlier to have breakfast? You're probably going to be in you know, downtown Barcelona by the time we're racing. Excellent. <laughs> well, you know, things happen late at night in Spain. Exactly. I'll, I'll come to the track and watch it with you. No, I'll, I'll forget breakfast. I can do, I can do with that. Um, good luck to him. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much. I'll see you in the paddock. All right. Thank you, guys. Cheers, mate.